Hello everyone, and welcome to a special Amtrak 50th anniversary episode of Train Talk, as well as the first episode for 2021. To celebrate 50 years of Amtrak passenger train service in the United States, we are going to briefly explore the history of the company, more formally known as the National Railroad Passenger Corporation. We will discuss how Amtrak came to be, as well as some of the major changes it has undergone over the last half century as America's passenger railroad. Now let's go back to how it all started. The beginning, 1960s through 1971. Amtrak's first day of operation was May 1st, 1971, but the story actually begins a few years earlier. Prior to Amtrak's inception, most railroads handled both freight and passenger traffic over their own rail lines. The height of passenger rail travel in the United States was during the first two decades of the 20th century. While the passenger business was never a large money-making operation for most railroads, it was a service they took pride in as it was emblematic of their railroad as a whole. There was another brief surge in traffic during the 1940s, but in the two decades thereafter, rail travel again went into decline, seeing increasing competition from both road and air. Into the late 1950s and throughout the 1960s, many railroads were drastically cutting passenger trains to prevent going into bankruptcy. The final straw for many of these railroads was the loss of the U.S. mail contract in 1967. Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, one of the largest railroads at the time, estimated that the continued burden of hauling passengers would result in operating losses as great as $75 million annually by 1975. The handwriting was on the wall for the future of the passenger train. Believing that passenger rail travel was still an important service to provide for the traveling public, particularly in spread out rural areas with fewer options, and hoping to prevent a complete end to rail travel in the United States, members of Congress began drafting legislation to save passenger rail. What they came up with was the Rail Passenger Service Act of 1970. This act established a for-profit corporation that would be in part financially supported by federal taxpayer funding. The new railroad company was to operate, maintain, and otherwise manage passenger rail services for the continental United States. A formal name was chosen for this new hybrid private-public entity, the National Railroad Passenger Corporation, or NRPC for short. RailPax was selected as the company's operating name. Shortly before the new company took over passenger rail travel, this was replaced with the name Amtrak, a combination of America and track. As stated in the act, Amtrak was to provide the major railroads a chance to opt or buy in to having their passenger services taken over by the new company. Any railroad choosing to join Amtrak would be relieved of having to operate public passenger train services of their own, but would potentially be subject to allowing Amtrak to operate trains over their rail lines. To buy into the program, railroads could provide the NRPC with either cash or railroad equipment in exchange for common stock. Railroads who chose not to join Amtrak were required to continue operating their passenger trains at least until 1975 and thereafter would still be subject to obtaining governmental approval from the Interstate Commerce Commission before ending any services. As required by the Act, Amtrak was to begin operations no later than May 1, 1971. On October 30, 1970, the Rail Passenger Service Act was signed into law by U.S. President Richard Nixon and Amtrak was officially established. Initially, 20 railroads out of 26 that were eligible to participate opted into the program. Some continued to operate their own passenger trains for a few more years before joining, while others never did. Amtrak announced an original national network on March 22, 1971, and just over a week later established its official headquarters in Washington, D.C. Roger Lewis, who had previous experience with several companies in the aerospace industry, including General Dynamics, was selected as the railroad's first president. For the 20 railroads that initially joined Amtrak, the final day of passenger operations was April 30, 1971. The following day, May 1st, was Amtrak's first day of service. Rebuilding the National Network, 1972 to 1980. In the beginning, Amtrak's system consisted of 21 routes serving 43 states. These, to a considerable extent, were services that were largely unchanged from their previous operators. Some other routes were pieced together from a combination of services that had been operated by multiple different railroads. The routes were, for the most part, only given numbers and endpoints to identify them in the original timetable. 
By the third edition of the system timetable in November of 1971, most trains would once again be given names in addition to numbers, a long-standing tradition in the U.S. passenger rail industry. The system consisted mostly of long-distance trains across the country, some of which operated on a tri-weekly frequency with the rest running once daily. There were also a few corridors that operated more than once per day, including the Northeast Corridor between Boston, New York, and Washington, D.C., and the San Diegan running between Los Angeles and San Diego, California. Amtrak began on day one with a hodgepodge fleet of equipment inherited from the 20 railroads that opted into the program. This mostly consisted of old General Motors Electromotive Division built E and F units and streamlined Bud and Pullman built passenger cars. By the time this equipment entered Amtrak service, most of it was at the very minimum 10 and often 20 or 30 years old, which is well beyond the average useful service life for most conventional rail equipment. In the Northeast, electric GG1 locomotives that dated as far back as 1934 were still being used to haul the trains. Amtrak needed new equipment and quickly. For the cross-country long-distance services, the first major equipment purchase made was for 150 General Motors EMD SDP-40F diesel electric locomotives that began arriving in 1973. These six-axle locomotives were based on an off-the-shelf freight locomotive design and used the legacy steam heating system for the passenger cars. Later equipment would use electricity drawn directly off the locomotive's diesel engine or separate electrical generators to provide what came to be known as head-end power for all passenger car electrical needs. The SDP-40Fs were plagued by several derailments resulting in several railroads banning their use over their tracks. Opinions vary, but it is believed that either the locomotive trucks or water sloshing around in the steam heater were the likely culprits. On the electrified Northeast Corridor, Amtrak was also having issues with its new General Electric-built E-60 locomotives. Like the SDP-40Fs, the E-60s were also based on a six-axle freight locomotive concept modified for passenger use, and had issues with the trucks eventually being limited to a maximum speed of 90 miles per hour. Disappointed with the performance of both of these locomotives, Amtrak looked for replacements. EMD presented Amtrak with a new long-haul diesel in the form of the F40PH. The F40 was also modified from a basic freight locomotive design, but utilized four axles instead of six. Thirty of these locomotives were delivered in 1976, and the railroad was so pleased with them that the vast majority of their SDP-40F locomotives were traded in to EMD for more F40s. Eventually, Amtrak would come to own a total of 216 of the units. Back on the electric side of things, Amtrak would finally be able to retire the ancient GG1 and supplement their E60 locomotives with the AEM7. This little four-axle locomotive was built in partnership with EMD and Swedish company ASEA and patterned after an off-the-shelf Swedish design that was modified for American use. The AEM7s performed well, and with a top speed in service of 125 miles per hour, Amtrak could return many trains on the Northeast Corridor to a faster schedule, making the route an even more competitive option for travel along the eastern seaboard. With the combination of the F40PH and the AEM7, Amtrak's motive power woes finally seemed to be at an end for the time being. In addition to locomotives, Amtrak's circa 1940s and 50s passenger car fleet was also in desperate need of replacement. In 1975, Bud began producing nearly 500 Amfleet 1 cars for inner-city corridor use. These were based on the Metroliner self-propelled electric cars of the late 1960s. A long-distance version, dubbed the Amfleet 2, was debuted in 1981. Fortunately, the rollout of these cars went much better than the first generation of new Amtrak motive power, and so successful were the Amfleets that they continue in regular service to this day. The long-distance fleet received a refresh with the development of the bi-level Superliner car in the mid-1970s. These were based on the Santa Fe high-level cars built by the Bud Company in 1956. A fleet of 284 Superliner 1 cars was built by the Pullman Company and began entering service in 1979. In the 1990s, a fleet of 195 Superliner 2 cars was constructed by Bombardier Transportation. As Amtrak continued to build up its supply of new rail equipment, it was also adding new routes to the system. Within the first year of operation, the Lakeshore and the North Coast Hiawatha were added to the timetable. Others would soon follow, including the Adirondack, the Palmetto, and the Pioneer. 
The first international service came in 1972 with the addition of the Seattle-Washington to Vancouver-British Columbia Pacific International. Unfortunately, many routes would again be shortened or eliminated altogether due to budget cuts in 1979 and others in the mid-1990s including the Desert Wind and the Pioneer. Early on in Amtrak's history, much of the heavy railroad equipment repair work was contracted out to other railroads. That all changed in 1975 when Amtrak was able to purchase the old Beech Grove, Indiana shop complex in the suburbs of Indianapolis from the Penn Central Railroad. To this day, all heavy diesel locomotive and car repairs and overhauls are carried out at this facility. In 1976, Amtrak was also able to purchase the vast majority of the Northeast Corridor between Washington, D.C. and Boston from the Penn Central. This was the first and one of the only stretches of track acquired by the company. With control over this critical rail line, Amtrak was poised to make some much-needed improvements to this 150-year-old railroad infrastructure over the coming decades that would help build the route into a thriving transportation link. Intercity Growth, 1981-1999 With new equipment and growing ridership, Amtrak entered the 1980s looking to continue system expansion. One option that became of increasing interest was to seek individual states to partner with Amtrak for new corridor services. The first state sponsorship of an Amtrak train occurred as early as May 10, 1971, when the states of New York and Ohio sponsored the Lakeshore train on its route between Chicago, Illinois and New York City. However, it wasn't until the following two decades that state sponsorship of Amtrak trains really began to take off. From fairly early on, the states of New York and California contributed significantly to inner-city trains in their states. New York's primary focus was on the New York City, Albany, Buffalo, Empire services, while California's efforts were scattered throughout the state. Through the California Department of Transportation, the Amtrak California brand was created in 1976 to help manage state funds going to various inner-city trains. With increased state funding, service was expanded on the San Diegan and San Joaquin routes throughout the 1980s and 1990s. In 1991, Amtrak and the state launched the brand new Capital Corridor traveling between Sacramento and the San Francisco Bay Area. So successful was this new service that it soon became one of the busiest routes in the Amtrak system. California and New York were not the only two states to partner with Amtrak. Illinois and several other neighboring states worked with Amtrak to improve and create several corridors in the Midwest including the Hiawatha, Wolverine, and Illinois Zephyr. In 1990, North Carolina worked with Amtrak to establish funding for the Carolinian from Charlotte, North Carolina to New York City. Five years later, the Piedmont Corridor was also created, providing service between Charlotte and Raleigh. New equipment was purchased specifically for use on this corridor. This was part of an emerging trend of several states and Amtrak purchasing new equipment intended for a specific rail corridor. California bought a series of EMD F-59 PHI locomotives and bi-level passenger cars for their Amtrak California branded services beginning in 1993. The states of Oregon and Washington also partnered with Amtrak to fund services and new equipment for the Eugene, Portland, Seattle, Vancouver rail corridor. New sets of Talgo rail cars were purchased in 1998 for the new Amtrak Cascades branded service. Ownership of the equipment was split among Washington, Oregon, and Amtrak. Additionally, in 1998, Amtrak began a 20-year lease for 21 F-59 PHI locomotives intended for use on the newly rebranded Amtrak Cascades and Pacific Surfliner trains. As part of this project, Amtrak partnered with the state of California to purchase new bi-level rail cars for the Surfliner. In 1999, Oklahoma joined the list of states to support their own inner-city Amtrak trains with the introduction of the Fort Worth, Texas to Oklahoma City Heartland Flyer, Oklahoma's first passenger train service since 1979. During the 1990s, planning also began for yet another new corridor train, the Boston, Massachusetts to Portland, Maine Down Easter. This train would make its debut in December of 2001. Various other improvements were made throughout the system during this two-decade stretch. A number of projects were carried out along Amtrak's Northeast Corridor, including a significant grade-crossing elimination program and the even bigger Boston to New Haven electrification project in the late 1990s in preparation for new services that were scheduled to debut in the following decade. 
1983, Amtrak acquired the privately owned Auto Train, which ran a unique service between Lorton, Virginia and Sanford, Florida, carrying people's personal vehicles with them on board. To date, the Auto Train is still one of Amtrak's highest earning routes. New equipment was also purchased during this period, including more than 100 F-40 locomotives and more Superliner cars. Additional new Horizon and Viewliner passenger cars were delivered in the late 1980s and early 1990s. More new locomotives would also come in the 1990s with General Electric designing a brand new passenger diesel that would be dubbed the Genesis series. These locomotives were state-of-the-art for the time and met all height and width clearance restrictions on the entire Amtrak system, meaning that they could be run anywhere. 44 P40DC type locomotives were built in 1993 and 207 P42DC units were constructed from 1999 through 2001. A third type, known as the P32 ACDM, was designed to run off either the onboard diesel engine or from an electrical third rail and was deployed on Amtrak's Empire Corridor out of New York City. Also during this period, Amtrak experimented with hauling mail and express on some of their long-distance trains as a new source of revenue. This was done in an effort to make the company more financially independent. Amtrak ended the decade of the 1990s on a high note with the anticipation of America's first high-speed train, Acela. Accelerating into the 21st century, 2000-2009. As the 20th century came to a close and the 2000s began, so too did Amtrak's moves toward more modernization. With an eye to high-speed rail services in other countries, there was a considerable push to bring faster trains to the United States. Planning for a new high-speed train began a decade earlier with Amtrak testing several off-the-shelf European designs. Ultimately, Bombardier and Alstom were selected to build the new trains, which would run in between Washington, D.C. and Boston on the Northeast Corridor. On December 11, 2000, the Acela Express made its debut. The trains were a success, particularly with business travelers. As a whole, the Northeast Corridor saw significant ridership growth during this period, eventually reaching a dominant market share in between Washington, New York, and Boston. To supplement the electric locomotive fleet, and enable the retirement of the E60 locomotives, 15 Acela HHP8 units were purchased from Bombardier and Alstom in conjunction with the new Acela Express trains. Unfortunately, like their E60 predecessors, the HHP8s never lived up to their initial expectations suffering from reliability and wheel slip issues. Nonetheless, dependable service on the Northeast Corridor continued thanks in large part to the tried-and-true AEM7s. About half of these locomotives had been completely rebuilt between 1999 and 2001, receiving new alternating current traction motors for even better performance and reliability. With the final P42 locomotive delivered in 2001, the last of the F40 locomotives were ready for retirement with all units completely withdrawn by the end of 2002. Service on the Northeast Corridor was again expanded in the late 2000s when the state of Virginia became yet another partner with Amtrak. Looking to improve passenger rail in the northern portion of the state, Virginia began funding additional extended Northeast Regional service south from Washington, D.C. to serve Lynchburg and later Richmond. Over the decade, many other states also increased frequency of their corridor trains, resulting in even greater ridership gains. Amtrak's mail and express hauling business finally came to an end in 2002 when new president David Gunn began to eliminate what was left of the service. This was due to an overall decline in business as well as a wish to refocus on passenger hauling operations. As a result, Amtrak had a surplus of long-haul locomotives and express material handling cars. The 44 P40 locomotives built in 1993 were placed into storage. Some were eventually sold to other transportation agencies. Many of the retired material handling cars were also eventually sold off. A few routes that relied heavily on business from mail and express handling, including the Lake Country Limited, Three Rivers, and Kentucky Cardinal were canceled as a result. 2005 also saw the suspension of service on the Sunset Limited in between New Orleans and Jacksonville, Florida due to track damage caused by Hurricane Katrina. 
Later in the decade, Amtrak received a special round of funding as part of the 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act to overhaul 15 of the stored P-40 locomotives and return them to service. From 2002 through 2011, Amtrak would go its longest period with no new passenger rail equipment acquisitions since the company's inception in 1971. This would all change in the following decade as much of the fleet neared the end of its useful service life. Fleet Renewal and the Next Generation, 2010 to Present With the turn of another decade, Amtrak's at one time new equipment was starting to show its age. In particular, the fleet of AEM-7 electric locomotives were all at or approaching 30 years of operation by the time 2010 rolled around. Under the leadership of recently appointed Railroad President and Chief Executive Officer Joseph Boardman, Amtrak entered into an agreement with Siemens Mobility of Sacramento, California to purchase 70 new ACS-64 electric locomotives to replace both the AEM-7s and HHP-8s on the Northeast Corridor. Boardman would go on to be the second longest serving president of Amtrak following William Graham Clater Jr. of the 1980s. The first ACS-64 locomotives were completed and tested in 2013, and in February of 2014, they entered revenue service. The locomotives proved to be a success. Deliveries continued through mid-2016, at which time the last AEM-7 locomotives were finally retired. Over on the west coast, the F-59 PHI locomotives used in Pacific Surfliner and Amtrak Cascade service were fast approaching the end of their 20-year lease to Amtrak. Additionally, the states of California and Illinois were looking for new locomotives to purchase for their routes. A consortium of states including Illinois, California, and New York began planning specifications for the next generation of inner-city diesel locomotives in an effort to standardize future passenger rail equipment acquisitions. The three major requirements that were agreed upon were a top speed of 125 miles per hour, Environmental Protection Agency Tier 4 emission compliant, and clearances acceptable for tunnels and electrical third rails in New York State. Siemens Mobility responded with the SC44 Charger diesel-electric locomotive based on their Vectron series of European diesels. The states of Washington, Illinois, and California placed a joint order for chargers with the first units completed in 2016 and revenue service beginning in mid-2017. California would go on to order additional chargers for both Pacific Surfliner and joint San Joaquin and Capital Corridor use. The F-59 PHI locomotives were withdrawn and returned from lease in late 2018 and early 2019. Along with new diesels, the states of California and Illinois ordered new passenger cars to expand operations. After delays from original contractor Nippon Chariot for bi-level cars, Siemens was subcontracted to produce single-level cars for both states. During the 2010s, there was also an effort to acquire new single-level equipment to expand capacity on several of the eastern long-distance trains and replace the last remaining heritage fleet cars that dated back to the 1950s and 1960s, most of which were baggage cars. Beginning in 2012, the Spanish company CAF began producing the first of 130 Viewliner 2 cars in Elmira, New York. These were to be built in four different variants, baggage cars, dining cars, sleeping cars, and combination baggage and crew dormitory cars. Due to production delays, delivery of these cars was still ongoing as of early 2021, but all the baggage car variants were delivered and entered service from 2015 through 2016. Also in 2016, new train sets to replace the original Acela Express equipment and expand capacity were ordered. The new Avalia Liberty trains were designed and constructed by Alstom and are capable of speeds up to 220 miles per hour. Deliveries began in early 2020 and the first trains are set to begin operations in late 2021 or early 2022. The GE Genesis fleet for long distance and inner city service was starting to show signs of aging with the first locomotives in the series reaching 25 years in age in 2018. With an eye to the future, Amtrak selected Siemens Mobility to produce 75 new Charger locomotives in December of 2018 with options for an additional 100 units. The new locomotives would be modified from the original SC44 model, receiving bigger fuel tanks, a new detachable nose piece, and rated at a slightly lower horsepower. 
these new locomotives would be given the model number of ALC-42. The first two locomotives were completed in the spring of 2021, with testing set to occur over the summer and an anticipated entry into revenue service in the fall. Jumping back to the beginning of the decade, Amtrak celebrated its 40th anniversary in 2011. To mark this occasion, four P-42 DC locomotives were painted in previous schemes used by the railroad. A special exhibit train was also put together with displays examining Amtrak's history. Joseph Boardman retired from his post in September of 2016 and was replaced first by Norfolk Southern Railroad's Wick Moorman and later Richard Anderson. Anderson led a new effort to achieve profitability for Amtrak by the year 2021. In early 2020, on the cusp of reaching this goal, Amtrak was greatly hindered by global health concerns, causing large decreases in ridership and across-the-board temporary service reductions. Anderson retired from his post in April of that year, replaced by William Flynn. Later that year, Amtrak's leadership roles were restructured with Flynn being named CEO and Stephen Gardner as president. Despite recent setbacks, exciting times lie ahead for Amtrak as a fleet of new equipment begins to arrive, once again rejuvenating the railroad for the next few decades. In the course of 50 years, Amtrak took a national passenger rail network that was on the verge of complete collapse and managed to hold it together. While some services ultimately did not survive the transfer from the large private railroad companies, Others not only made the transition, but have in fact flourished, seeing expanded schedules and record ridership gains year after year. This is especially true for the various state-supported corridors. Indeed, Amtrak has gone from 15.8 million riders system-wide during its first full year of operation in 1972 to over 32.5 million as of 2019. So, 50 years down the line from the beginning, the natural question is, where will the rails lead next? In the coming years, Amtrak will continue to receive new ALC-42 locomotives to replace the Genesis series. Recently, the railroad has also announced Siemens as the preferred bidder to replace the Amfleet 1 passenger cars with new single-level train sets. State-sponsored services are also likely to expand and new ones will be established in the coming decades. Most recently, there has been a push to restore service along the Gulf Coast east of New Orleans on what was once the route used by the Sunset Limited. There have also been efforts to add additional trains in between Chicago, Illinois, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Minneapolis and Duluth, Minnesota. Amtrak has also proposed an ambitious plan to increase frequency on several pre-existing inner-city corridors as well as brand new ones such as Colorado Springs to Denver and Cheyenne or Nashville to Atlanta over the next 10 years as well. Wherever the trains travel next, one thing is for certain, Amtrak will continue to be America's railroad for many years to come. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me for this look at Amtrak's 50 year history. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future Train Talk episodes, leave those in the comments section below. For regular notifications every time I post an update or a new video to the YouTube channel, click on the subscribe button and check the receive all notifications option. Take a look at my other social media pages for more train and railroad related content. And remember, you can always stop by every Friday at 9am Pacific time for an all new railroading adventure right here on the YouTube channel. That's it for now. Until next time, I'm Mike Armstrong. I'll see you down the line. Thanks for watching.